So, how's it going there, Dan? Can Pretty you uh, give us some insight as to what's going down very soon? Uh, we're going to have a resource-based economy workshop, which we ran last week for the first time, and which we're hoping to run every week, so we can um, build on the idea and, and encourage people to research themselves. The what sort of topics are you about. covering today? Uh, more about resource-based economy function and the actual processes involved, its systems approach, uh, the emergent train of thought, technological unemployment and all these aspects that we, uh, that we talk about that are quite detailed but um, you know, at some point we have to go through them. So, As a member of Zeitgeist are you happy that there's basically been no um, demands at the moment? Yeah I am and um, uh, we were talking about that earlier actually and in a way I think that leaves the board open for um, for anybody to step in. There's no set demands at the moment which is which seems to be working quite well because as soon as you <laughs> develop a set of demands some people will support it and some won't. So at the moment it's uh, an open palette for everybody to step in and come together and work out uh, a set of demands, whatever you want to call them, or uh, to find a common ground where we can all actually start moving towards. Some sort of alignment? Yeah, yeah it's quite, quite essential that we create an initial alignment and, to move towards and that, that way things will actually have a direction um, which that's, you know, that process is underway and so uh, it's, it's um, in its absolute infancy right now so um, we have to be patient and just let it um, evolve naturally to a degree because there's a lot of, a lot of really smart people around here and a, a lot of people that can see the benefit of letting, letting people arrive at these uh, decisions for themselves. All right, uh, welcome everybody. Today's workshop is about a resource-based economy. And um, last week we covered, um, touched a little bit about the basic concept. And uh, this week we'll go a little bit more in depth. Like uh, systems approach, the emergent train of thought behind this, uh, the scientific method for social concern, automated technologies, uh, reduction of waste, unnecessary production, and so on. Uh, but the main idea of this will be to have a Q&A, a good Q&A after. So we'll just deliver a little bit of information for to get everybody thinking so we can all have an open discussion about it. We want to open things up as much as possible so we can all arrive at these conclusions. So Wiri, we'll start with a few um, basic tenets and then we'll just move from there. Uh, kia ora everyone, my name is uh, Rainbow Woody. I'm from the Zeitgeist Movement New Zealand chapter. We have around four to 5,000 members in New Zealand worldwide. We have about half a million members and we advocate a new social design which is totally different to a monetary system. It is called a resource-based economy. Uh, basically a resource-based economy is a new social design uh, which moves away from the outdated system of money, uh, even barter. It is a system where uh, we use technology in the most efficient and uh, sustainable way to help humanity with uh, the scientific method for social concern. So we use science as a way to take care of the human race because we find that the current system we're all in, and that's why we're here, is because uh, we've all suffered some sort of deprivation or loss and the system is not sustainable enough for us. So what we're talking about in, in terms of a resource-based economy has been in the workings for at least 75 years through different people who have worked on this process. And so we're here to just to give people some thought um, in terms of an alternative or possibility. We're not saying it's the only solution, but it can be a possible solution if we um, apply it in, in a good, sustainable way. So what I'm going to talk about is some problems and solutions. And the problems I'm going to talk about are things to do with the monetary system. And then I'm going to come along with some possible solutions in terms of a resource-based economic model. We can look at problems as flaws. So in the monetary system, there's quite a lot of flaws that people don't even understand or know. Um, the first one I want to talk about is called the cost efficiency mechanism. And with the cost efficiency mechanism, people in this system save money to make profit, which leads to sub-quality products. We call that planned obsolescence. So people actually plan to make sub-quality products, which break down within a certain period of time. Therefore, the products that are pushed out um, not only create a lot of waste, 
but a lot of people also suffer because they don't have the money to go back and buy more of those same products. But this is what the current monetary system perpetuates. Um, planned obsolescence, withholding of efficiency, which I just talked about. And one of the biggest uh, problems we have in this monetary system is called technological unemployment. Now technological unemployment basically is automation taking over people's jobs and it's happening right in front of our eyes right now. Campbell Live put out a question the other night and he said, are there enough jobs to cater for the beneficiaries? I jumped on the Facebook page and said no there is not. Yet no one really had any idea why people are losing jobs. Technological unemployment is one of the biggest contributors to loss of jobs and it will continue. Um, there's no new sectors that have been created either. People lose their jobs. Uh, kiosks are coming in, warehouse, pack and save. People are now cashing out all their goods and services now. So people on there are going to be eliminating uh, their jobs. I'm a taxi driver. GM Motors have just created a vehicle now they can drive you home. Um, so you can get drunk out on the night. You don't need a taxi driver in, in the near future. And uh, my job's going to be lost as well. Um, so you can't stop this this increase of technology humans are advancing yet the social structure is static and that's one of the major problems the other thing is cyclical consumption now I know these are quite jargonous words um, but we probably get used to them now there is a DVD we do have here as well so you can take that away and so you can help yourself a bit more with some of the concepts I want to talk about cyclical consumption now the basic entire global economy relies on cyclical consumption and what that is is that I'm an employee, I have an employer, yet both of us are consumers. I need to rely on my employer, he needs to rely on me. We have to work together but we're both consumers at the same time. If there was not cyclical consumption then the whole system would fail. You need cyclical consumption in this monetary system. Now the problem with cyclical consumption is that it thinks that there's infinite growth but that's a big flaw as well because there can't be infinite growth when the resources of the world are only finite. We only have finite resources. The other thing is the incentive system. Now there's an assumption made that if people were not motivated by profit little progress would be made. However when we look at people like Einstein, Nikola Tesla, those people didn't create things <coughs> They, for, for profit, they created them for the betterment of society, for the betterment of humanity. And so the incentive in this system is totally flawed as well. The other thing I want to talk about is competition and how competitive the nature of our uh, monetary system is. Now the, this pursuit of competition set, sets up an us versus them mentality. And that mentality extends into all facets of society, which leads to corruption, inequality, waste, distortion, and someone has to miss out, like musical chairs, someone's got to miss out, like American Idol for instance, there can only be one American Idol, scarcity, now scarcity is a big one, profit can be made as a result of scarcity generated by environmental pollution, now if you didn't know there are organizations out there that find diamonds and they burn all those diamonds now to keep the price of diamonds up. The Kimberley mines in Africa do that. They find diamonds and they burn those diamonds so that the price of diamonds stays up. This has created scarcity. It's like if we don't produce enough oil, I've got all the oil there, but they don't produce it, the price of petrol goes up. So in this system, that's one of the flaws as well. Another one is property. Now I know a lot of you have uh, your own notions about property, but property is pretty much a primitive mental perspective generated from generations of scarcity. People claim ownership because it is a legal form of protection. Um, and property is a, a, a big one. We're not actually born in this world with resources in our pockets and we don't take those resources away when we leave them. We just use them while we're here. And the final thing I want to talk about in terms of problems with this social structure is family cohesion. And what that means is that monetary economics undermines family cohesion. There's high stresses for parents to go out and get a job, to supply food for their family, and it leads to things like psychosocial stress is one of the biggest contributors to suicide. And uh, it results when we look at perceived threats in our lives. So those are just a list of some of the problems in this society. What I want to do now is talk about 
possible solutions in a resource-based economic model. Now these solutions have been put together and designed. As I said, it's been over 75 years in the making through people like Jacques Fresco and a whole bunch of others who have come up with these ideas. And it's based on workable models. In a resource-based economic system, we look at things like the incentive. People contribute on their level of education in a resource-based economy. They'll have expanded <coughs> education, which encourages critical thinking. In this monetary system, we have an education system that teaches you how to repeat. You become repeaters. Whereas in a resource-based economic system, you have access to all information, all knowledge to be critical thinkers. Yeah. And this gives us intelligent, aware human beings who gain self-fulfillment, social awareness, creativity as opposed to self-interest goals of wealth, property, power, divide and conquer. In a resource-based economy, collaboration is going to be one of the biggest pluses. Instead of competing with one another, if we look at collaborating, collaboration in a resource-based economy, the incentive is proven to be far more productive and meaningful than competition, and that's scientifically proven. Decision making. Decisions are arrived at by the use of the scientific method using open source automation, gaining real-time feedback from the environment. And we're doing that right now. How did we all get here? We use technology, internet, phones, communication. We're heading that way now. So decision makings are, are used by technology to give us the most accurate ways of making it, or of arriving at decisions. If everyone can input into some sort of database, then the, the decisions can be arrived at through technology. Also, science as a methodology, fact-based using scientific method, feedback from nature and utilizing natural law, gravity, how nature works. With the scientific method, problems could be solved without having anyone to decide what the solution will be, because solutions would arrive from logical analysis of situational <coughs> variables. Logical analysis of situational variables put in simple forms is basically when you use a calculator, you put the right facts into the calculator, the calculator will give you the right information. That's what it simply means. In a resource-based economy, automation will basically be one of the biggies. Statistically, anything that is mechanized today is more productive in operation than if you had a majority of people doing it. Now, what I mean by that is if you had a, a plane and you're in a plane and you look down, you cannot actually say how high up you are by the millimeter. In terms of a radar, that's where a radar comes in and does. It tells us how far we're up accurately to the millimeter. Technical unification of the globe, which is what uh, Dan is going to talk about using a systems approach. Uh, what I do want to talk about was participation. All people can participate without having to work for a boss. People's contributions will be based on what people have done, their experience and their level of education. And they also will be revolving into disciplinary teams like technicians that will oversee and monitor and maintain the system and help orient research projects to continue to grow. Um, in a resource-based economic system, where resources are available to people. People have what we call unrestricted access. It's like a library. In a resource-based economy, people go get what resources you need because there's no system of exchange. You can't take 10 vehicles and sell them because there's no money in the system. You only take what you need. People will have access to all resources, technology and services. Therefore, only property will not exist. The real issue relevant to meeting human needs is not ownership, it is access. People use things. They do not own them. As I said before, we come into this world without resources in our pockets. We leave this world without resources in our pockets. We just use them while we're here. So while we're here, why don't we use them in the most efficient, sustainable way? Also, ownership is a non-operational protectionist advent derived from generations of scarcity. In a resource-based economy, the strategically best possible goods will also be used. So this will get rid of things like planned obsolescence. We won't have planned obsolescence anymore. We'll be using the best vehicle at this particular time, updated to present-day knowledge. We'll be using the most advanced technologies in a resource-based economy to the highest standard. Amen. Uh, those are just some of the components of a resource-based economic system. As I said, it's it quite intricate to talk about, and quite a lot to take in, I know. 
A monetary system creates a conditioning aspect that rewards ego which stems from scarcity and competition. If we're ever to bypass that, we need to look at a new social design. A resource-based economy is put together in a systems approach which Dan will talk about of resource management as a whole to make life better for people, for everyone, using methodologies and processes. Now some people are coming to me and going, well, how are we going to make a transition to a resource-based economy? We're in a monetary system. How do we get from here to there? And that is a, a big question. I honestly don't know the answer, but I do know that there are pockets of our society at the moment that, that people are actually sort of moving into that transitional stage and that transitional stage that, that I'm talking about is people are changing their own values within themselves from there people are collaborating in their communities setting up their own community gardens and that's where it starts it starts with your community starts with yourself so the transition is a transition of culture it's a change of consciousness first to create a critical mass on the planet once you change your stuff start collaborating within your communities a resource-based economy is global in nature but local in implementation that's pretty much my talk at the moment on a resource-based economy and some of the components and i'll give you some more uh, discussions about a systems approach within a resource-based economy. Awesome, thank you. I'll just run through um, a talk that's called Systems Approach. Um, it's quite complex, but I'll just sort of skip through it as much as I can. Um, it's part of the method that enables us to actually arrive at decisions rather than um, making opinions. And the technology we have now enables us to do, that, to do this. Um, it's a single aspect regarding the direction and train of thought behind a resource-based economy. It is a key factor to understanding human decision-making and problem-solving beyond the political sphere or majority vote. We focus on root causes or persistent problems within the social operation of our planet, especially in regard to the more notable negative outcomes, such as crime, poverty, war, pollution, debt, and other forms of corruption. While it's logical to understand the problems first, we can sometimes miss the focus on aspects of the solutions we propose, even though there is plenty of information available. We speak of rep replacing all forms of symbolic ex exchange with a global resource management uh, system of the Earth's resources, not money sequences, because these new methods <coughs> provide a more equitable method of distribution of the most humane and efficient manner the entire population. Uh, we update our houses, cars, computers, phones, industrial machinery, business systems, hospitals, service sector, entertainment, etc, etc, because advancements render previous designs obsolete. So why should the most important system of all, our social system, not undergo constant change in relation to new understandings? Holding on to outdated traditions for the sake of tradition is irrelevant and counterproductive to our survival. At the foundation of what we advocate is a global management system, which could be termed a resource-based economy, which is a social structure that is global in operation and based entirely on the Earth's resources as the starting point for the social, uh, societal decision making. All goods and services are available without use of credit or barter or any other form of debt or servitude. All social and industrial operations are arranged in what we call a systems approach, which logically treats the planet uh, Earth as a single system that it happens to be. We also advocate the application of technology to the automation of labour to free humanity from the mundane and arbitrary occupational roles which have no true relevance to social well-being. Most importantly, we want to encourage a new value and incentive system through this, this social design which maintains a focus on attributes such as community, human well-being, relevant education, social awareness and creativity. Our relationship to the earth and the environments we live in is not a political issue or a religious ideal. It is a technical relationship. <coughs> 
separate a living organism from, from its surroundings and it will die from a lack of oxygen, water and food. Organisms are open systems that can not survive without continuously <coughs> exchanging matter and energy with their environment. Since we observe systems interacting with each other as part of a whole, it is then logical to start with a unifying system of the biosphere in which we all inhabit. Systems thinking can be defined as an approach to problem solving by viewing problems as part of the overall system rather than reacting to individual problems as isolated or unrelated unrelated phenomena from the larger order. When taken as separate, such patchwork solutions uh, may further the development of unintended consequences, such as trying to resolve the problems of monetary inflation with more inflation, trying to fight the destruction of our rainforests, the increase in plastic waste with more laws and legislation, rather than addressing the cause of the behaviour to begin with. Systems thinking is not one thing, but a set of practices within a frame framework that is based on the principle that the component parts of the system are best understood within the context of relationships, rather than in isolated isolation from one another. For example, what we agreed is a symptom, not a cause. <coughs> this brings us to the system approach. The system's approach to resource management on the planet is comprised of real-time data and statistics. This approach combined, combined with the attributes of peak efficiency, strategic preservation and conservation become necessary components of what we call a sustainable society. The process of decision making is based on natural law and reason, not on political ideology or religious notions or a group's opinion. When using a systems approach, we arrive at decisions as opposed to making them. Making a decision is a subject of act, act often based on incomplete information or influenced by one's cultural bias. Yep. Our goal is to remove the basis of one's opinion as best we can by using up-to-date knowledge uh, to align with natural processes to the best of our abilities at a given time. This is an emergent approach because the body of knowledge of human understanding changes over time as new discoveries are made. There is no final frontier. Therefore, human management of the environment of the environmental equilibrium on this planet comes first from understanding what the carrying capacity of the earth actually is. It follows that the needs of the human population must be in balance with the resources of the earth when negative outcomes occur. So, where do we start? What is the first step to determining the carrying capacity of the earth? This is where a system of systems approach comes in. A logical start would be to conduct a full survey of the Earth's resources, since we must know what we have to work with in order to arrive at any decisions. There are many natural resources to be considered, such as forests, ocean, oceans, energy, along with arable land, water, and minerals. But for the sake of simplicity, let us refer to these components as natural resources. Is it too futuristic? The te technical know-how for such a comprehensive survey is often considered too futuristic, but there are current real-world technical systems working in this regard right now. For one, NASA's, NASA's current Earth-observing fleet of satellites, with names like TRIM, Landsat 7, EO-1, Jason 2, Race, ISAT, Terra Firma and Aquarius. These unmanned probes are beaming down quietly with information that is transforming our understanding of how the Earth works and what we know about human, our human fingerprints on our climate. Together they represent an application of technology in real time, working as part of a global survey system, not something from Star Trek, not something from hundreds of years away, but orbiting the planet right now. The satellite Aquarius is designed to take comprehensive salinity measurements of the Earth's oceans in their entirety every week. The data, the data obtained from these measurements helps to answer some of our most pressing questions about climate change. Why salinity? The density of the ocean water is determined from its salinity and from its temperature. The density of ocean water drives the patterns of deep ocean currents and ocean currents drive global change. Continuing uh, these examples, the Terra Firma and Aqua satellites gather data of the Earth's surface every two days. 
from food production to population density, including future projections, they show where the food is growing versus where the food is consumed. It then overlays the world's population density and then phase to show the countries that are projected to double and triple their populations by the year 2050. There also exists a mineral resource data system, which is a statistical survey conducted by the US Geological Survey. They describe the collection of mineral resources throughout the entire globe. This is an, another example of information that would be part of a global knowledge base comprising a resource management system as one function of the systems approach that we have been exploring. Another example of visualising a systems approach in action is viewing compiled data. A member of the Google Earth community assembled an image from the CIA Factbook showing world oil consumption. It shows the relationship of oil consumption between countries. The US shows its tremendous consumption of about 21 million barrels per day, which is almost 25% of the earthly total of 82 million barrels of oil consumed every day. So, how would we possibly interact with a system of such immense data? Example, our current evolution of text-based search engines, which, um, which, we're familiar, which we're all familiar with today, enables us to interact with a vast knowledge base via computer or AI assistance. An example of an AI computational search engine already exists, Wolfram Alpha. This engine generates output by doing computations of its own internal knowledge base instead of searching the web and returning you links. In a resource-based system, this concept can easily be scaled out to include the immense amount of data that is currently being collected in public in both the public and private sectors of the world today, along with the many free information and data products out there via the internet. One could well ponder the equation that if with a little cooperation from our technological friends, could we actually have a path laid before us to move in this direction? Maybe the world is simply waiting for enough people to want to do so. The point is there are many real world working examples to show how such a collaborative social system is a technical reality and not a someday phenomenon. I hope that this helps you to understand how a systems approach to resource management can work, how we can approach problem solving beyond the sphere of politics, how we can arrive at decisions via science rather than human opinion or majority vote, and how current technology can be applied to make such a global resource-based system a reality. So we'll just um, go forward with a bit of Q&A and whatever we feel like doing, an open discussion. Um, now, what would you propose to do? How, how hard would you be willing to fight if, if there was um, an organisation like, like the Reserve Banks, like the International Monetary Fund, that actually did start doing this? Would you be prepared to fight back with violence because if they got violent that's that's what you would need to do I'm sorry well look they've got a lot bigger guns than we do they've got missiles now that could hit us right now if they want to so I'm not going to go fight against them with my kitchen knife or whatever I mean come on it's ridiculous that violence you know okay the system that we've got when we are changing any system we cannot change any system by resisting it. History taught us that. All the wars are started and we have no end of finishing them. So we cannot change any existing system by fighting, doesn't matter what it is. Even in our personal relationships, we cannot resist. So the one big thing we need to know is what we resist will always persist. So in order to change any system, we need to build another model we need to build another model and work towards putting our all energy into the model. That's what we are doing now here. This movement is all about um, actually showing people, giving them aware about all the new system that we got placed, which is collectively thinking, which is thinking for one another. And when we focus our all attention onto this system, the new system, the new thought movement, the new way of becoming and the old one we will no longer put any attention to, slowly, slowly the old system will no longer have any power because we actually awakened everybody else around it. So we slowly, slowly move away from the old and work on the new one.
Just to answer Anton as well, um, absolutely, I don't believe most of us would be here, okay, if it wasn't for the fact that someone like Bradley Manning, for instance, that's one of the reasons I'm here anyway, not necessarily him, because this has been done many times before, but there is always someone who's a catalyst for these kind of movements, and whoever that catalyst is for you, and the reason that brought you here, all right, those are the sort of things that work far better, as they say, as, you, as you're witnessing in places like Israel um, and the West Bank and things like that. You are never ever going to succeed against that. And also, the problem is you're going to have people on the opposite side who are going to discredit you, they are going to devalue you, they are going to pick... And, they're doing it with Phil Goff at the moment. Well, they started yeah, that when that Helen Clark was still in power. Yeah, yeah. So basically what you need to do, and not by violence actually, because that will put off the very people that you need to work from within to destabilize it as well, is you need to encourage people who have the same talents, the same visions, and the same abilities. I mean, the fact of the matter is, uh, the bottom line is, out there, a load of people think that we are a bunch of stoner, unemployed, hippies. mental anarchist hippies, okay? Now, I embrace that because on my Facebook before I left, I actually put on there, I am just about to go down to join in disguise all the unemployed, inarticulate, uneducated uneducated stoner hippies I'll catch you later and give you a little bit of an update and this is my picture okay and I put a picture up of the very first day when I was here with him and my daughter and came on the very first day here now those people on my Facebook who know actually what I am all right and who I am will be laughing and they'll be going look what Jack's put up on her Facebook and they'll be talking to someone else and later on when I get back, if that car hasn't been towed away, they will be going, what happened? What happened? And I'll be going, okay, this is what we, as the collective stoner, uneducated, ignorant, illiterate, anarchist hippies talked about, okay? I rest my case. The point I'm making here, right, is if you keep telling other people that they're your enemy, right, they're going to treat you that way too. If you use tools, all right, yeah. to do the reverse, to deconstruct what they think, yeah. rather than using the same paradigms they use, yeah. it's the first step. Cool. Yeah. I'm a writer, yeah. alright? Cool. I am not getting paid for what I write about here. Are any of you getting paid for being here? No. no. So when I came down here today, okay, I brought c coffee because I had some spare stuff in my cupboard, alright? And, trying to cut down and I brought other bits and then I went off and bought some milk I'm not going oh wow I'm so wonderful but that's what I could give okay and in turn I am receiving education here about zeitgeist which to be honest with you, I haven't had the time I know all about the, the, the and I'm gonna be really interested to what but what I'm saying is we are already doing it on a very small scale here now if we can persuade people out there to go okay I am a banker I work in the bank I've got friends on my Facebook they are yeah. bankers so if I can persuade them to pop in here with anything right and for them to sit here and go oh my gosh you're not what We've got bankers in our we, movement. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So we are already doing it. We've just got to spread. We've just got to spread that and make so how, it so what, inclusive. What do you think is the best way to do that? Um, it, it's exactly what we're doing. Nothing is going to change quickly. All right, my daughter's 22 yeah. and my son's 17. Everything's yeah. now. They want everything now. Yeah. They want this now, yeah. right? We have got to persuade people to realise that the now doesn't work actually because as soon as you've got something now like you said no, well, you want something else now because that's just been made redundant or it's oh, obsolete. Oops, sorry. Yeah. sorry. And um, quite clearly the occupation movement which now exists in 2,355 cities, completely 2,355 <laughs> cities and towns completely unprecedented at the moment and we have to remember that what we're doing right here is happening at pretty much all of the other yeah, occupations. It's a mirror. Yeah, it's a mirror. Yeah, the, it's a mirror. It's a mirror, yeah. 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 And it's happening right now yeah. in a collective. And that's what we have so to be. Yeah. We have to be mirrors for the good and for the and that's what I write. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I'm a mirror too. Yeah. We're all mirrors. Alright, yeah. if we can all learn yeah. to understand that and appreciate it and keep 
we have bad days. On the bad days, we're crap mirrors, yeah? yeah. On the good days, we're inspiring good mirrors. mirrors. Yeah. Yeah, that, totally. That's the bottom line. Yeah. But if we understand that light and dark, yeah. it's the same thing. Uh, I just thought that um, it's an idea from me that we, we've got so many cities around the world that's with this um, Occupy movement. And I just thought, and there are so many different voices, so many different ideas. And they are not, if, if we don't somehow um, keep them on the record, all these voices is just going to go mm. everywhere and mm. nothing. And so I, I reckon that we need um, a record of all the great ideas on them and then spread it across the, the, the how many cities? 2,000 cities? Systems approach. And then people can really look at, well, these are our solutions. These are what we can do, can start, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, part of the systems approach that we talked about earlier and it's also part of um, what the conclusion came to with last week's um, Why Are We Here workshop. We sort of all threw up our hands and realised actually there's technology to help us organise these systems and one such system is um, Open Atrium which we use a little bit of and it's a project management system and it works in a tiered system with teams, coordinators of each team. So it enables a system where anybody from the outside world can just step into and contribute. At the moment, you walk in here and it's like, well, where do I, where do I sign up? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this team, I've got, I've got these skills and stuff like that. And we can manage these things with systems, with the amazing systems that we have available online and stuff, and it will make everything a lot more efficient. So um, part of the occupation here is actually helping them also to um, put all this within a systems approach. Um, yeah, we, we went really well. We started with the basic concept of a resource-based economy and then moved into more of a, um, some of the technical side and particularly focused on um, a systems approach today um, and used the example of an earth-wide resource gathering system which we talk about <coughs> as the system that really makes money obsolete now today. It's a current technology which renders the use of any form of um, symbolic exchange obsolete. Um, as far as the movement goes, we're, yeah, Atrium, Open Atrium, we're developing the project management system Open Atrium, which is specifically for projects and people that actually want to get involved with the, with the progress of the movement. And it's, um, it's a, basically a project management system, so it handles all these things really efficiently and we touched on that a little bit today as part of the um, systems approach too. So um, we're preparing the system at the moment, it's not hosted yet but it will be we hope in a week or in a couple of weeks and at that point um, every, every New Zealand region will have their own chapter to start designing and collecting members. Um, so it's actually a really, really nice um, system to use once you start using it and I think people will um, feel quite invited to really get involved and start collecting teammates and um, getting involved in that way. Um, well yes, these resource based economy workshops we want to run every Saturday down here in Auckland. So we're just going to keep building on the process and record it each time so we have a, a log of the information that we're going through. Um, but I'd say also for Zeitgeist members all over the world and New Zealand um, to actually spend a bit of time within the occupation, just contributing within the teams and the groups here because that really gives you the ability to see where people are coming from because it's a whole different ball game down here, literally. There's a whole different feeling going on and, and people are opening their minds to new ideas in such a way where you need to come in and sit back and listen first and then you can evaluate. Um, you'll arrive at a way of uh, getting this direction across in your own in your own way. How do you think the global Occupy movement will move forward from here? Well, at the moment, um, it's, it's a process of aligning ourselves to a common goal, and that way uh, we're, we'll actually have the collective energy to move forward and start arriving at decisions um, collectively and logically. And um, I think really the public are not going to get on board until they see the merit of a new social proposal. And so when this, uh, this is going to take some time to actually bring people in alignment with each other. You know, we all have common common goals here. Uh, we all have common problems on, throughout the world. Um, it's no coincidence that a small elite run the show in every single country. So every single country is suffering the same problem because all throughout the world, 
it is the same system running the show so therefore we have the same problems and so we have to align ourselves to common goals and then uh, discover the direction, arrive at the direction collectively like that and so uh, to reiterate the, the public I don't think will um, or the big shift won't happen until um, the public see the merit of a new social proposal that will clearly show how um, unsustainable this current situation is which uh, really people don't realise actually how dangerous the system is becoming for the whole planet and for humanity and um, so it's a case of aligning each other with each other. And a message also to the masses there about being very careful of uh, repackaged uh, social designs that are going to still be framed within the uh, preset guidelines of the current system. Example, a one world currency, RFID chip, maybe? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, in fact, the Vatican have already proposed the idea of a new global bank, which would be essentially a new one world currency. And many people have been warning the public about this for years and years and years. And so they'll pull out all their tricks, which are really quite weak nowadays. Um, and so it's a case of being aware of these things and uh, not falling for them, basically, because they're um, tricks that will keep the established order where it is and people enslaved to it. Do you think it'll be still rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Yeah, precisely. It's such a great analogy that the, the Titanic is going down, rearranging the deck chairs really isn't going to stop it from sinking. And also, to add to that, the first class cabins on the Titanic went to the bottom just as quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. That's a good analogy. <laughs>